I'm Dr. Mose Durs, the president of the Unification Church of the United States. Professor Herbert Richardson of the University of Toronto has said of the unification principles that they are perhaps the most significant statement of theology in the 20th century. The media, on the other hand, mock the idea that a Korean man, Reverend Moon, should come to the United States and teach this nation something about Christianity. We all know that the Unification Church has been very controversial. Every great religious teacher has been controversial. In the following videotapes, we present a brief overview of the unification principles. I have found them in my own life to give me a great guide for relationship with God and relationship to my fellow human being. They offer me a basis for spiritual life and a way to live well in the world. We present these tapes to you as our offering, our sharing, so that you may share with us your response, your inspiration, and your vision. We hope then, in our mutual sharing, that we can come closer to God and thus closer to each other. Hello, my name is Tom McDevitt. And it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce the unification principles to you. We'd like to start by explaining why in the world would any church send out videotapes of its theology to other churches. First of all, the reason is not to convert you or even to change your faith, but for the sake of communication. I mean, who could deny in the last 10 or 12 years the unification church has been misunderstood, to say the least, and misrepresented? sometimes in a really unfair way. Rarely has anyone been able to really examine what the beliefs of the church are or what the motives are of the members who have worked so hard in America. So first and foremost, for the sake of communication, we gratefully and humbly extend these messages to you. In the last three years, Reverend Moon has been going through quite an ordeal in his court case, and in that experience, thousands of ministers who have signed to go to jail with him for a week, who have really come to his aid on the basis of religious freedom, have been in a situation where they ask our people, what are your beliefs? What do you teach about Jesus? What do you teach about the Second Advent? What is it about the unification family philosophy that is so unique? So we'd like to answer those questions. We'd like to be very straightforward here and, and, and really clear so you can have a basic appreciation of unification doctrine. Now why is that important? The reason, again, is important is that is we have got a lot of work to do. America is certainly seems to be getting a little better, but there is so much out there, so much pain, so much faithlessness, and certainly who could deny that the church needs revival and unity? Nothing wrong with that. The second reason why we are making these tapes is because we extend them to you as a gift. Actually, it comes from Reverend Moon himself, who would like to offer these tapes with the hope and the prayer that they would provide a, a, an insight or a, an inspiration in your ministry, perhaps in your counseling or in the work you do with uh, young people, in your leadership view, in the way you look at the providence of God in America. Maybe you'll find some insights that you didn't expect here. So they're offered as a gift. And we certainly hope that you could take the time from what must be a very busy schedule to, to look at these tapes and to think about them. And then ultimately, of course, we've got to pray to discern whether these things are useful and whether the messages are true. So we leave that point with you, of course. Well, this brings me now to the beginning of, a, of an introductory statement. And I'd like to share a little story that I learned from a friend of mine named Pastor Jink. And he uh, tells a story of, of a pastor who went to church on Sunday, and his member went up to him and said, Pastor, why do you have that cut on your face? Well, the pastor looked at the member of his church, and he said, Gee, you know, I guess this morning when I was shaving, I wasn't concentrating on what I was doing, and I was thinking about my sermon I was going to preach, and, well, I cut myself on the cheek here. I, I, that's how I did it, cut myself shaving. Well, then the member looks back at the pastor and says, gee, pastor, that's too bad. Maybe next time you should concentrate on your shaving and cut your sermon. 
Well, I don't want this message to be too long, but I would like to express some important foundation ideas here about this principle. First and foremost, what is the unification principle? We normally refer to unification principles as the unification theology, and they comprise a vision or a guide. It comes at a time when life is changing rapidly, society is developing very quickly, and yet we as many are concerned about the direction the changes are going in. We have questions about the future, about God, about life, about when Jesus will come, about why, if God is absolutely good, is there evil on the earth? These kinds of questions have plagued us for centuries, and we feel that the time we're in demands answers that are more appropriate to a modern era. For these reasons, the unification principles are offered as a guide or a vision for people who want to live righteously. Now, where did they come from? What is the authority of the unification principles? The principles are based upon the experiences that Reverend Moon had with Jesus Christ and with God, our Heavenly Father. Actually, it was in 1936 that Reverend Moon, in deep prayer on a Korean mountainside, met Jesus in the Spirit. And our Lord commissioned the young Reverend Moon at that time to take upon himself a mission to unify and revive Christianity. Hard to believe, perhaps, but that is the testimony of, of my pastor, of my leader. And he then went with that, that spirit to unify Christianity, commissioned by Jesus, in order to bring us towards the point of the kingdom of heaven. On this basis, he prayed, he searched in the scriptures, and gradually a sense of understanding and answers to questions was, were revealed to Reverend Moon. The essence of those uh, questions, the essence of that message is the content of the divine or unification principle. Now, an important thing here is that Reverend Moon never aimed to establish his own denomination. Very important for you to understand. He never wanted to build his own church and start a new denomination. The Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity, formal name of the Unification Church, is purposed only to be a revival movement within the broader landscape of Christianity. And consequently, in 1946, he came to bring that message to the traditional churches in Korea. He suffered in a communist prison camp for nearly three years. And never did he give up his aim and his goal to ease God's suffering and to comfort Jesus' heart and to work to overcome the obstacles that he perceived God having. Those obstacles face you and myself as a, as a pastor of a church. First of all, the obstacle of selfish love that is the essence of the cancer that breaks down the family. Second, the disintegration, fragmentation, and, and division within the church. Jesus never tells us in the scripture to make many churches and let them fight with each other. Third is the problem of communism. We can't win a war against communism with nuclear weapons it has to be with the spiritual weapon of God's truth. In order to solve these problems, Reverend Moon developed this prayerfully, this theory, this, this uh, way of life, and began to share it with his followers. It basically says, God is a God of suffering, and yet originally God's, God's heart was filled with, with deep love. And God as a parent of love manifested that love in the creation so that the entire universe is, in a sense, a reflection or the embodiment of God's love, the artwork of God. And God hoped that his original son and daughter would achieve the ideal of love on the earth. Tragically, the fall of man occurred. And so history begins from the point of a big mistake. And yet, God could not give up on his children, but has worked through history to restore us back to that original ideal. Well, now, how has God worked in history? It's been through people, always people on the earth. Amazing, isn't it, that the dispensation of our Heavenly Father is enacted on the planet Earth, in the physical world, in people who are built with a body and a mind. Abraham was one who offered sacrifices, initiated the providence of Israel. 
And yet when Moses came, God initiated the, the era of the word. By following the word, we were able to come to God. Jesus came later and Jesus revealed a new message. He did not come to repeat what had been said. He came with a new message, as you know very well. And it was not easy for the chosen people of Israel to accept Jesus purely because of that fact, mainly because of that fact. And yet Jesus opened up a new era of the dispensation. Now we are 2,000 years down the pike from the time of Jesus. Is God alive? Don't you believe God is alive? If he is, and if there are people on earth today who want to heal the world, wouldn't God speak through them? Then if God speaks through people today, it would be to modern man, and we would hope then in a rational, reasonable way that we might make sense of so that this world can change. From this standpoint, we can examine the gospel and in the statements of Jesus Christ himself. In the book of John, chapter 16, verse 25, we read from Jesus, I have spoken to you in figures, but the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures, but tell you plainly of the Father. I believe that hour is now, this era, this century. Earlier in the same book, 1612, I have said many things to you, I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. In the book of Revelation 10, verse 11, you must again prophesy about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. In the book of Ephesians, we read from Paul that we are, he prays that we would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. And one of my favorite passages in the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. The Bible speaks to us that in the last days we can expect a new version, a new perspective, a new view of truth. Well then, uh, how could this be possible, you might ask? How could it be possible that God give us a new revelation? Jesus spoke of the same problem in his day in Luke 5, 38. When you know well, he spoke of the new wine go, going into new wineskin. New thought, new views, bigger minds have to be uh, accepted by people who are like children. Then, if God spoke through Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, certainly through Jesus, who would God speak through today? We can't say to our people that it is impossible for God to reveal a message in this day. It's not fair. God can do that if he wishes. He certainly spoke through you when you gave a sermon to your congregation that made sense to them and caused people to burn with a desire for repentance. Absolutely, God spoke and worked through the founding fathers as they designed a nation in America based on religious freedom. No question that God worked through Dr. Martin Luther King. You know, Reverend Moon was once asked, who is the most important religious leader of, of uh, America in the 20th century? He said, Dr. King, because he taught that all people are God's children. Now, if God wanted to speak through you, he will do it. It was John Wesley who said, my parish, my congregation is the world. Reverend Moon's prayer was no different. Reverend Moon, in a way, is a Moses of the time a prophet through whom God has spoken a message that naturally it's up to you and to me and to all of the people around that hear these words to pray and discern whether it's meaningful. Well, what's the essence of this message? God is aiming to restore the world of the ideal of creation. And there are five reasons or five areas that this message is going to deal with. The foundation here is that through history, through the providence of God, God has spoken a new message as his providence awakens. He, he builds the basis of the kingdom of heaven by speaking a new word. The Bible predicts that there will be a new message spoken. And the world we live in is tragically boiling in sin. How else can we restore America today unless God works in our life and unless we have some new insight from heaven? So the five areas I want you to remember. One, the family. Families are made up of people. People need to be reborn and invigorated by the Holy Spirit 
so that our selfishness can transform into unselfish love. As though a quiet revolution of the unselfishness of man's heart will change the world. The family must be restored, revitalized, blessed, invigorated. And unless we do something as ministers about the situation of morality in this nation, something not legalistic, not simply preaching sermons, but a real solution to the cause of evil in the family, of the misuse of love, of selfishness, has to emerge. Then secondly, the question of the expansion of the family to the family of humankind. Why is it that black, white, yellow, brown, red people have had such a difficulty uniting? It's because we haven't seen God as our parent. The only way that we can solve the problem of war and difficulty in the world is when God comes into our hearts as a nation and as a people we can embrace each other, regardless of the skin color. When the black and the white man and the yellow man touch each other and they know they come from the same parent, Heavenly Father, then they can see the divinity in each other's eyes. The third reason why we need a new truth is that we have a scientifically rational uh, world, a world that emphasizes the material side. And we've got to be able to harmonize our religious way of life that sometimes is contradictory with reason. We've got to have a view of life that embraces both. The fourth reason is that religious people around the world all believe in one God. There's one God that created the universe and yet many religions. Our view here is that in the latter days, our Heavenly Father is working to bring all religious people in their respective times, according to their respective culture, to the same Messiah. Jesus Christ came not for just the Jewish people nor the Christian people, but for the world. Then to unify religion, we need a view of life that can embrace and show the value of all religion. And this is the only way that Christianity in the central position can fulfill its destiny and its purpose. The final reason why we need a new truth in today's world deals with the problem of materialistic, atheistic, and militant communism. Unless we can come to a new worldview that's based upon a Christian, God-centered, Christ-centered society, we have very little hope in the years and decades to come. We face a tyranny far greater than anything that Hitler ever imagined. And it is only with the revival of a true God-centered society, based upon an ideology we can call Godism, where all people can unite together under one Christ and one God, where Jesus' spirit can live among us. It's the only way we can solve the dilemma we face. I've got thousands of friends who are my brothers and sisters in Christ who have been invigorated and reborn through the content of the unification principles. A power of vitality within the very message itself has confirmed in my heart and in many of ours that truly God is working to open us up and reveal a new day and a new dawn. And it is our deepest prayer that the content you're about to study will have similar meaning to you. Thank you very much for listening to the introduction here, and we're going to begin with the first presentation entitled The Principle of Creation. Thank you very much. Let's begin our first presentation, The Principles of the Creation. We're going to examine the question of the existence of God. The reason is important in order to make sense out of the world, in order to solve problems in the world today, we've got to recognize that we are made as a result. We did not create ourselves. Nobody chose the day or the hour or the parents to which they were born. We are the results of a creator. In order to understand the, how to solve the problems of the world and of our life, we've got to know the nature of the creator. And there's another reason why we'd like to begin with the understanding of the nature of God. God must have had an ideal in his mind when he created the universe. He doesn't do anything without a purpose. Therefore, God's will or God's ideal, which is the foundation of the creation of the world, is the basis 
that we stand on. The fall occurred, and the fall had to be restored through history so that Jesus came. In order that we can more fully appreciate Jesus Christ and what he actually did, doesn't it seem that we can now look to see the nature of the fall? And in order to understand and appreciate the tragedy of the fall, we therefore examine the nature of God's ideal. I realize that that might be a new perspective, a new view, a new paradigm. And yet, let's examine and see if understanding the nature of God can help us to produce a better life as a religious person. Well, then we're struck, st struck with a problem and stuck with a problem. And that is that God is invisible. We can't see God with our physical eyes. So we have to look and see what God made. And by examining what God made, we can know the nature of the Creator. Certainly, we claim that humankind is the image, made in the image and likeness of God. So we should think that if we look at ourself, we should see the nature of God. But then we're contradictory. One man in history, one man in the dispensation of God's work did fully embody the life and heart of God. That's Jesus Christ. If we look at Jesus, we can know the nature of the Father exactly. It was Jesus who taught us that God is our Father. That was new. That was revolutionary. God was not simply the master and we the servants, but God is our heavenly parent, our heavenly Father, and we are the children adopted into his family. In addition, Jesus taught us that we should be brothers and sisters, loving each other as he loved us. Thirdly, Jesus taught us a selfless way of life. The most important aspect of that is that he taught us to love our enemies. He hung upon the cross when people cried out against him. He digested all of that resentment and anger and loved us and forgave us. These aspects of Jesus' heart express what we call heart or the heart of God. The nature of God's mind expressed fully in his son. Then the nature of God is one in which his desire for love had to be fulfilled by he, his creation of an object of love. He created an object of love that he could have a relationship with. And that object, therefore, is made in his image and likeness. Just like when we have children, they look like us. That's why Romans 1.20, in the book of Romans 1.20, St. Paul tells us, ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and deity are clearly perceived in the things that are made, therefore they are without excuse. On this foundation, we can see God in the creation. Examining the creation, we see that there are a, there is a dual characteristic. There is a, a certain kind of pattern in the creation that's helpful and educational. Every person has a mind and a body. The mind is invisible, the body is visible. And the mind should guide the body. We call the mind the invisible internal character, and the body is the visible external form. In addition, we can see in animals an instinct and a body. The instinct is invisible. Consider the American buffalo. Has a tremendous personality and character. A real legend in the history of our country. A buffalo is not simply a machine and it is not simply a pile of meat. It has a character, a spirit, that guides it along its course of growth. Plants have been examined in science and have been shown to have uh, a non-physical, non-material element. Atoms, molecules, and particles all operate according to laws. Those laws can be studied by scientists. The conclusion here is the entire creation has a dual aspect in every entity. That dual aspect is one of an internal invisible character and an external visible form. Then God as the creative source, the origin of all life, must have the attributes of an internal character and an external form. God's internal character is his mind, his heart, his love, his intellect. His external form is his divine energy, 
his universal prime energy that is the basis of all the creation. And these dual aspects in God are fully harmonized. There's another set of characteristics we can perceive in the creation. And again, we begin with people. There are male and there are female people. When a mind and a body are harmonized, they turn out a personality that's either masculine or feminine. The basis of love is the fact that the human race doesn't have three species, but two, a masculine and a feminine aspect. The same is true in animals, in plants, molecules, atoms, and particles. All are based upon the relationship of two parts, the positive and the negative pole in a battery creates a situation so a charge can occur. This is fascinating because every aspect in the universe has these dual characteristics. That means that there is an incredible, incredible universal will that's behind the whole cosmos. And there, there, therefore, if there is a will and a plan, there must be an ultimate goal or aim. And that ultimate aim, that ultimate goal that God was trying to reach is an outpouring of his own inner nature. It's the fulfillment of love. How could God have ever created such an inc beautiful universe, infinite beauty? There are so many different species of every aspect of the creation. So many different people. And yet we all have only eyes, a nose, and a mouth. I mean, we only have so many things you can play with as an artist. And yet God created us so that we would never tire of each other if we are truly in love with God and in love with one another. The point here is that God is the original creator, the subject of the creation, and he consists of a being who is almighty and all-powerful. And yet, he has these dual aspects of masculinity and femininity. That's how we can see the fatherhood of God expressed through a, a true husband and the motherhood of God through a true wife. In conclusion, God is a harmonized being of the dual characteristics of masculinity and femininity, as well as the internal character and external form. Now, when we look at the, at the cosmos, we find that every single entity bears these characteristics as though they have chromosomes of God. And therefore, if we look at anything, we can see the nature of God reflected in the things that have been made. Remember Paul's statement in Romans 1.20. So this brings us now to the to the second theme of, uh, of our presentation here, that having established that God exists and that God has heart, intellect, and will that make up his inner mind, he expresses that heart through energy so that the rose, the snowflake, the mountain, the redwood tree, the human being express God's love substantially then having established that God is this kind of original being, let's think about how God has actually set up the universe. This reminds me of a story of the popular preacher, Dr. Charles Spurgeon, who on one day was admonishing a class of divinity students. And he was talking to them about the need to harmonize your facial expressions with the content of your sermon. And Dr. Spurgeon says to his students, when you speak of heaven, then you should express your face as though it were illuminated by a heavenly beam. Let your eyes reflect heavenly glory. And when you speak about hell, your everyday normal expression will do. The point here, of course, is that God expresses his beauty through the creation. Give and take action is the basis of relationship around the relationship of give and take action is generated energy. Nothing can exist in the world without energy. Energy is created by relationship. Relationship occurs when the subject and the object are able to relate unselfishly. Subject and object, simple terms. We use them frequently in unificationism. They refer to the two aspects of any entity, the mind and the body, a husband and a wife the proton, the electron. Sometimes we tend to think, perhaps because of our fallen nature, that we exist for the sake of ourself. And we find that whenever we live for the sake of ourself, expecting everything to come to ourself, 
we break everything down. A person who lives for the sake of others is always the one that we like to be around. You know how it is when you go to see someone and you know that they're concerned about you, that they'll be willing to listen to you. They'll be willing to simply hear your story and not judge you and not give you a hard time. It's incredible how powerful unselfishness is, and yet it's incredible how dark and how difficult selfishness makes our lives. Unselfishness is the basic requirement for the ideal relationship of give and take action to occur between any two people. Give and take action assumes that we live in an interdependent relationship with each other. Not only do I have a unique identity as Tom McDevitt, but I need you. I need a relationship with you as a brother or sister in Christ. We are born to relate and to harmonize because that's the way love can be fulfilled. Give and take action is the basis for the forces of existence, reproduction, and development. And when give and take occurs in any entity, we naturally come to a place of harmony where we want to extend and reach out to more. We, we want to have give and take with a bigger and bigger realm, so to speak. Examples of give and take could be the mind and the body, inhaling and exhaling, the blood circulating around our body, uh, the relationship between parents and children, the relationship between a husband and a wife, employee and employer, the government and the people. All of the constellations of relationship that we are able to maintain in our life will either be good, heavenly, and productive, and loving, or selfish, evil, destructive, and they will break down simply because of the manner in which we relate. Let's examine the question of give and take action in relationship to God. Our relationship with God originally should have been an ideal relationship on the basis of our obedience to the commandment. If that had been if that had occurred, then our relationship with our descendants, in other words, if Adam and Eve had formed the perfect bond with each other centered on God, their descendants would have been in line with God's spirit and they would naturally relate with each other as, as true brothers and sisters. It's only because of the fall that we were cut off in give and take action from God. Therefore, we are dead and need to be raised up again in Christ. But then again, we find that our descendants or people in the world are unable to relate with each other in a pure and ideal way because of that original problem. The Messiah is sent in order to show the model of give and take action with God. Jesus was the Son of God and the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way we were able to come back to God was through Jesus. Jesus taught us that we should judge not lest ye be judged, for the judgment you give will be the judgment you get. He taught us, knock and the door will be opened. He washed the feet of his disciples. He told us that, we should not, he, that the Son of Man did not come to serve, did not come to be served, but to serve. The conclusion is that Jesus Christ as the Son of God enables us to come into life through give and take action. As God and Jesus have shown us, give and take is based upon unselfishness. In order to receive anything, it's important that we give first. But yet it's so difficult, isn't it? Terribly difficult to teach people in today's world about the value of unselfishness. Certainly only an act of God would be able to do that. Well, let's kind of summarize these ideas here a little bit. Based upon this, God is a being of absolute goodness who's fully harmonized in himself. And he expresses his creativity in, uh, in, the, in nature and in the world by creating everything with a subject and an object. Based on the relationship of that subject and object, there is a union. And the union comes to have the position of a third substantial object to God. Once these four elements are put together, we have what's entitled in unification principle a four-position foundation. The four-position foundation is the basis of goodness the foundation upon which God can work. An example in the time of Israel would be when Moses and the Israelites unite together, centering on God's will and on the law, they form a covenant. The union is the covenant. 
When Jesus comes into our life today, we take the object position to Jesus, centered on God the Father, and we form a new life. In a family, the husband and the wife relate with each other as the representatives of God, and they form a child. That's the four-position foundation for a family. In an individual case, our mind relates with God's will, and our body follows the mind as forms the nucleus of a true personality. When we relate the four-position foundation to the created world, the natural world, then we see that the creation is in the object position to mankind, and through our relationship of true stewardship, of true lordship over the creation, we accomplish what we can call the ideal world. In all cases, when the four-position foundation is established, we can witness the personification of God's nature in those relationships. That's why we can say with all of our sincere hearts that God created men for women and women for men. God created our eyes not to look at ourselves, but to see each other. God created our nose not to smell myself, but to smell the fragrance of a spring breeze and to appreciate our Heavenly Father. He gave us a mouth not so that we can talk and listen to ourselves preach, but so that we could share our heart and our mind with one another. The point is that we are existing for the sake of relationship. Well, let's draw this to a conclusion then in the question of the purpose of creation. The purpose of God's creation must have been within his own heart and mind. And that purpose would have been the fulfillment of the ideal of love. We all wonder why we are here and where we're going. Reminds me of a story of a little boy coming home from church when he asked his mother, Mommy, is it true that we came from dust? And the mother said, Yes, dear, that's true. A little farther along, the little boy said, Mommy, is it also true that we will go to dust when we die? And the mother said, Yes, dear, that's also true. Well, then the little boy said, Well, Mommy, when I said my prayers last night and I looked under the bed, I found someone, and I don't know if they were coming or going. Where will we go? Why do we exist? The most fundamental questions in life. What's our purpose, and why are we here? The purpose of any being exists, the purpose any being exists is because of the Creator. The Creator has an idea in his mind, and he creates that being. God has an idea, a reason to create us. And already we've talked about the idea that God is a being of love, a parent of love. The nature of God's uh, personality is that he is a, a God of heart. Heart is the impulse to create an object of love, to unconditionally pour ourselves into that object so that the object will be satisfied and happy. The word object may be a little confusing here. When I use the word, I'm referring to someone in the position of the recipient, the creative and the responsive aspect of a relationship. When people have children, when a husband and wife has, have children, they pour themselves out in the children and the children respond with joy. You know, it, it brings to mind a, a most miraculous moment in my life when my wife and I were able to witness the birth of our first child about a year and a month ago. And I shall never forget the preparation that we put into it, the, the getting the crib and uh, the, the blankets and the sheets. And even I can remember when I bought my first box of diapers. It was kind of an interesting feeling because I was doing something for the sake of someone who was going to come in the future. And I didn't know what that little boy was going to be like. I didn't know it was going to be a little boy to begin with. Well, the point is, on the day that he was born, we're gathered in the maternity ward, and of course my wife is going through the labor pains, and I was sitting there with my mask and my hospital gown on, and I'm telling you, I was nervous, and yet I felt somewhat comfortable, because I, I truly believe that God does these things to us, you know. And then the baby came out, and I saw through the mirror, and I started to cry because I felt 
this is just a miracle. It's just, I couldn't put it in words. Just the feeling came up. At the same time, I was so happy, I started to laugh. So my laughing and my crying were all mixed together. Even my wife looked over. She's going through the labor. She looked over at me because I was making these funny noises. The point is, I couldn't believe the miracle, the, the preciousness of creating a child. God looked at Adam, and God looked at Eve, and he saw himself. He saw his own flesh and blood. And his desire was to be fully united with that flesh and blood. The purpose of creation is that God wanted to experience the deepest joy, which can only come when a parent completely expresses their love for their children, and the children completely respond with no separation. That's what we call, in unificationism, the ideal of love. Well, joy occurs when the subject and object relationship is such that the subject invests in the object and the object responds. An artist paints a painting, he sees his image in the painting. As long as the artist has the idea of the painting and does not express that idea, it doesn't come out. There's no substantial joy. And when the artist puts the painting on canvas, when he puts the paint down, that's when he can see the result of his creativity. Likewise, God could not be happy until he finally could see his children in the ideal world. He created mankind in the position to respond to God the most fully. Mankind is the one. Rocks are beautiful. Mountains are gorgeous. Trees are majestic. Fish are interesting. But only people can respond to God's deep inner heart. God is a loving parent, a loving parent that can only express his fullest love to someone who will respond. And who are the respondents? It's us. Our purpose of existence is that we are created to live eternally as God's children. I learned this from the unification principles 12 years ago, and I'll tell you, it has made my life completely different to realize that my life exists for the sake of giving God joy. Not simply to follow the law, not simply to be faithful and believe in something I can't see, but to truly be the Son of God. Then how would it come about? Genesis 128, refer to it. It says that God blesses his son and daughter and tells them to be fruitful to multiply and have dominion over the things of the earth. In these three words, to be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion, unificationists find the essence of the purpose of creation. Now remember, we're living in a time when we want to know God more, and God wants to speak to us, we claim, and how can he better inform, of, inform us of his love than to clarify his purpose of creation? I really believe this is a revelatory aspect of unification principles here. What does it mean to be fruitful? It meant that God wanted Adam and Eve to each embody his character. He wanted us to become the living temple of the Holy Spirit. It was Jesus Christ who said that you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect in the book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. When our mind and body are fully harmonized with God, we become people of deity. We become men and women embodying God's will. The first blessing would have returned to God infinite joy as each individual person would reflect God's character back to him. Upon the basis of the first blessing, then we were able to continue to establish God's ideal in the world of love in the human realm. This brings us to the second blessing. Not only did God want us to become individually perfect, but he wants us to then express that vertical perfection horizontally in a family. Why is it that the question of love is the biggest question, the most interesting topic, the most passionate ideal that everybody looks to? How come in history the great art 
and poetry and music always has something to do with love. Someone told me the other day that if you look at the top 40, the songs that make it up on the top 40 are the songs that deal with love. Then how would that love be expressed? It would be expressed in a family. If Adam had accomplished his purpose as a, as a man, obeying the commandment, if Eve had accomplished her purpose, they then would come together and multiply children of goodness, and their, their children would be born without sin. That family would be the manifestation of God's spirit in the flesh. Think of it. God's masculine fatherly element living in the spirit and life of Adam. The feminine, comforting, womanly aspect expressed through Eve. And the two of them fully united, fully united in love. So much so that God is at the center of that act of love. No Satan, no selfishness, no evil, and the children are born without sin. And then that family becomes the nucleus of a society, a nation, and a world. Have you ever wondered about the kingdom of heaven on earth? Honestly, have you ever thought about what it would be like when Jesus comes back and builds his kingdom on the earth? Think of it. Psychologists tell us that human capability is only 10% at its expression. We've only used 10, 11, 12% of our brains. Well, let's imagine if we were able to use 100% of our capability, not just in the intellect, but in terms of our character and in terms of our love. But that's just individuals. Let's then think, what would the family be like if it reached a Christ-like stature? What would it be like if we were able to live in the love of God in the human love realm? How ugly love has become. Isn't it true that sexuality has become something we don't want to deal with? But God never created it for that reason. On this basis, the children of goodness would have been established. The kingdom of God, the Garden of Eden would be the nucleus, and the kingdom would have grown from there like a, a great tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good. On this foundation, we come to the third blessing, and that's to, be, uh, to have dominion over the earth and subdue it. And in this way, we can see that our God has given us the great and sacred position of the lords of creation. He wants us to use our ability to dominate the universe technically and spiritually. And this is the way that the ideal world would be set up. So the establishment of the three blessings would have been, could, can be seen as our original portion of responsibility. And the kingdom of heaven would have been the result. We would dwell on earth for a natural period of time, and then we would enter the spiritual world in the kingdom of God in the spiritual world. Now, we've discussed the purpose of creation, and we've discussed God's nature and give and take action. Now we come to the fourth theme of the principles of creation entitled human responsibility and growth. Isn't it true that nothing grows without a period of time? Plant a seed and it grows up according to certain stages of growth through a period of time. It reaches fruition. It blossoms, it blooms, oranges come out, apples come out when the tree becomes fruitful. Now this period of time we call the growth period. And there are three stages, reflecting in a way God's nature, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The three stages of growth we can entitle the formation, growth, and completion stages. And as we grow through those stages, we can eventually reach the goal of growing, which is perfection and maturity. When a human being reaches the stage of perfection, like Jesus, we then exist in the realm of being completely resonant with God, totally harmonious with God's thoughts, God's heart, God's desires. And this is what we call the direct dominion of God's love. Plants grow automatically to perfection. People only grow physically in an automatic fashion. Again, the natural world grows according to the autonomous power of God's word. And yet people do not grow automatically. 
We only grow when we aim to grow spiritually, when we nourish ourselves with the Word of God. When we accept Jesus Christ as Savior, we have made an act of responsibility, and that's how we can grow towards heaven. Now, the portion of responsibility that God gave Adam and Eve was the commandment in Genesis 2.17. Do not eat of the fruit. If you eat of it, you will die. Their portion of responsibility was obey the commandment. If they obeyed the commandment, they would have established the ideal of creation on the earth. God's grace was expressed in the commandment. God's grace was there because when we obey the commandment, we then become the lords of creation. It is not our instinct. It's not just natural power. But we as sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father command our life forward according to God's will. And the second reason why uh, the portion of responsibility is important, the first being that we become lords of creation, the second is that we co-create ourself. In order to inherit God's love, in order to inherit God's nature, He gives us a portion of responsibility that we are able to create a perfected self. We are able to join with God in creating a true self. And God cannot interfere with our portion of responsibility. Finally then, this brings us to the very significant question of the universe that we live in. We have a portion of responsibility to obey the Word of God. We know God's purpose is that the kingdom of heaven was to be established on the earth. Now, what is the environment? What kind of world do we dwell in? Our mind dwells in what is known as the spiritual world. Our body dwells in the physical world. The mind is able to deal with the spiritual world, which is beyond time and space. The body lives and deals with the physical world, which is a world of time and space. Then we find the incredible example of the spiritual world in the time of Jesus when we read of his uh, appearance of Moses and Elijah in Matthew 17, 3. The spiritual world is a very real place. We can't question its existence any longer merely because of the fact that even science is beginning to show us of the existence of the spiritual world. Now this reminds me of a, of a story of old Pete. Uh, you might have heard this before where the old man Pete was dying and, and had a miraculous recovery was in the hospital and his pastor went to visit him and the conversation went something like this his pastor said well Pete tell me when you were just at the threshold of death were you at, when you were at death's door weren't you afraid of meeting your maker and Pete said well not really pastor it was the other man I was afraid to meet isn't it true we fear death because we don't know what's going to happen we live in a world of time and space for a certain period of time. And I'd like to explain for a minute about the very nature that we have as we live on the earth. You know, we have a physical body that consists of a physical body and a physical mind. And we can refer to the brain and the nervous system as the physical mind. The physical body responds to the mind. The spirit is based in the same dynamic. The spirit has a spirit mind as well as a spirit body. So the spirit self is the reflection of the spirit mind. The spirit mind is the heart, the intellect, and the will. It's the core of our being, the most valuable aspect of our being. That's where we communicate with God directly. Our spirit mind seeks spiritual values, truth, beauty, and goodness, and love where the physical mind seeks the values of preservation and uh, sexual gratification. The spiritual self exists for eternity. Eternity. And consequently, life on earth takes the, the position of the tree that wants to bear the fruit. And how is it that that tree can bear the proper fruit? We have to be nourished. Our spirit must be nourished. It's on earth that we've got to build the kingdom. And in order to do that, we've got to bring the temple of God inside of us. 
Therefore, by receiving God's words, as we describe as life elements, God's words and God's love, life elements, life elements is the amazing power of God, the, the life force from God that we receive when we study his word, when we receive him in true life. Then the life elements have to be transmitted to the physical body. And the physical body then acts upon those elements and we generate vitality. If we do something unselfish, we generate goodness. The beginning of the lecture I started, and now after talking for so long, I'm coming to my closing here, you get energized because the vitality is like a spring force that comes into your spirit. The life element from God and the vitality element from earth generate the spiritual food of the spiritual self. The physical body has physical food, air, water, and sunlight, and, and that type of thing. The relationship between the physical body and the spiritual body is incredibly important. And the most important element that we've got to deal with on our life, in our life on earth is that of becoming sensitive to God's love. As children and as husband and wife and as parents, we have got to realize God's love here. And that's how the kingdom of heaven can be established upon the earth. In summary, we've discussed the nature of God and the world of creation. I hope that you're able to see the, the significance of relationship, profound meaning to such a simple truth. We've talked about the purpose of creation, the three blessings, the growth stage in human responsibility, and finally, we've discussed this issue of the spiritual world. The question of evil will be taken up in the next session. Thank you very much, and may God bless you. Hello. The title of this presentation is The Fall of Man. We've discussed God's ideal. We've realized that God is a, a God who is a parent to mankind, and that his original ideal is based on his motive of love, he wants all mankind to share in the happiness of his perfect love. That would happen through individuals, families, expanding to societies, a nation, and a world. His original ideal should have been established in the garden. And yet we see in our world a devastating, tragic, valueless existence because of the nature of sin. In the book of Romans 7.21, Paul tells us, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin which dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The contradictory nature that lies within every human being is not a nature that was caused by God. It was caused as a result of what we call in religious tradition the fall. And yet the fall could not have been something that God planned and God made because it truly broke his heart as we read in Genesis 6.6 6, that he repented that he created his son and daughter. Even Tolstoy mentioned that everyone thinks of changing humanity. No one thinks of changing himself. The point being that sin and evil truly lie in the center of every one of us. And it's the purpose of this lecture to share what the original sin really consisted of. What happened in the garden? Who is Satan? And how has the fall that occurred in the garden affected human life? The first topic we'd like to examine is the root of sin. We read in the book of Genesis that it was by eating a fruit that the original man and woman fell. But then was the fruit a literal physical fruit like an apple? Or was the fruit, the word, a symbol of something so extraordinarily desired, desirous of the, of the original ancestors that they were willing to risk their life to eat the fruit? Our view is that God, as a loving parent, could not possibly have placed a piece of food in front of his children knowing that it would kill them 
A loving parent would have no reason to do that. In Matthew 15, 11, we read in Jesus' words, it's not that which goes into the mouth that defiles a man. It's that which comes out of the mouth. And what comes out of our mouth is our words, our thoughts, our invisible feelings. Consequently, evil is not something that is caused by physical means, but it is caused in the spirit when we separate from God. We also have thought through history that the fall of man could have been the result of the failure of a test. God gave us the fruit, he gave us the commandment, and he wanted to test us to make sure that we were loyal to him. And I would ask you then, if you have children or if not members of your congregation, would you ever test your son, your daughter, or an innocent young person in your congregation at the threat of death? God is omniscient. Why would he have to test Adam and Eve to see what they would do? Remember, God's original motive is heart, love. His goal is not to test Adam and Eve and make them into some kind of robot-like uh, object, but he wants a being who grows in responsibility, who will become the embodiment of God. From this standpoint, we can see that the fruit was not a literal food, but the word fruit symbolizes something that was so extraordinarily stimulating that they were willing to risk their life. We don't risk anything in terms of our life unless it's more valuable than life itself. And what could be more valuable than love? Another insight we should bear in mind is that the world around us is a world that is spiritually bankrupt unless we seek the way of Jesus, unless we live the will of God, we live in a world that is valueless. Certainly, the basis of crime, the basis of sadness, stems from very fundamental causes. The most fundamental cause would be that in the family. When we grow in a family not tasting God's love, then inevitably the society will be corrupted. If we can heal the family, the society can be healthy and, and prosperous. What has caused such a devastating uh, pollution of love in the world today? Why is it that it seems so difficult to have a family that is uh, pure and healthy? You walk in, in, in every major city in America today, one can buy pornography or see prostitution or see the breakdown of morality in such a devastating manner. What has caused this? Why is it that we all feel so empty in love? If the fruit truly was a symbol, it grew upon the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then what was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It must have also been symbolic and it grew next to the tree of life. The tree of life is mentioned several times in the Bible. In Proverbs 13, 12, we read, a hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. In the New Testament, we read in Revelations 22:14, blessed are those who wash their robes, that they would have the right to the tree of life. In the Old Testament, the words tree of life represented the hope of those people. The same is true in the New Testament. When we cleanse ourselves in the last days, our Lord comes back in his glory and we have the right to him. Tree of life in the Old Testament represented what the Old Testament people lost. Tree of life in the New Testament represents what we're waiting for. What was it that Adam and Eve lost in the garden? Obviously, God valued the tree of life so much that he placed an angel with a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life. And the Old Testament people were approaching the tree of life. The New Testament age, we also look to the tree of life. What was it that Adam wanted? He had all the material possessions that he needed. He had power. He was the to be the Lord of creation, to be the Lord of creation upon fulfilling his responsibility. What was it that Adam wanted to achieve? 
He wanted to become God's son, God's true son, the living embodiment of the Logos. Had Adam achieved his responsibility, he would become a true tree of life. He would have given birth to many trees of life. Because of the fall, Adam became a false tree of life, and consequently, we have been born as false trees. That's why Jesus, our Lord and Savior, comes as a true olive tree. He tells us we must be engrafted into him. And Jesus is represented as the tree of life in, Revelations, in the book of Revelations 22, 14. Let me draw the conclusion for you that the tree of life was a symbol of Adam who was reaching towards perfection. When he attains that perfection, he becomes the tree of life. Tree of life is a perfected Adam. What is the tree of knowledge of good and evil? The tree of knowledge of good and evil grew next to the tree of life and therefore symbolized Eve. It has something to do with Eve as she reaches her state of perfection. When Eve moves to the point of perfection, she becomes the tree of knowledge. On this basis, then, the fruit grew upon the tree of knowledge. What was the fruit? The tree of life, the tree of knowledge, grew at the center of the garden. They give us a clue, a secret insight into what the fall really was. And again, I remind you, it is so important to examine the nature of the fall for today's world. Else, uh, otherwise, we have no way to extract the devil's work from us. Then, what was the serpent? The serpent was the one who tempted Adam and Eve. Was the serpent a real physical snake? If so, how could a snake talk, tempt man, know the commandment, dominate man through history? It says in the book of Revelations 12, 9, And that great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Here we read that the devil, or Satan, was the one who caused the fall, deceived and thrown out of the kingdom of heaven. Originally a spiritual being, who was in heaven, he fell and was thrown down to earth. Where did the Satan or the devil come from? Did God create Satan? If so, God is a being who can actually create evil, meaning that God can contradict his absolute goodness. Impossible. Did Satan exist with God from the beginning of the creation? If that were true, it means that every element in the universe should bear the resemblance of both this entity of evil as well as the entity of good. We don't see that in nature. Nature is harmonious, one line of purpose. It is only in humankind, only in us that we find the evil. The conclusion is that Satan was a being who was a spiritual being, originally good, who fell and became Satan. On this basis, we read in the book of uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and com committed them to pits of nether gloom, proving the fact that angels can sin. Serpent was an angel. The serpent was an angel who fell. Well, then how did the angel fall? What was the crime? Let's refer here in our Bible to Jude 6 and 7. The angels that did not keep their proper dwelling, but left their position, have been kept by him in eternal chains in the nether gloom until the judgment of that great day. And just as Sodom and Gomorrah just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise acted immorally and indulged in unnatural lust, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Indicating here that the sin 
of the angels was a sin of fornication, of the misuse of love. Fornication exists between partners. It's not a phenomenon that occurs by one person. Lucifer was in the garden, according to Isaiah 14, 12, the day star, the sun of dawn. The angel was in the garden as, with, as was Adam and Eve. Now, Adam and Eve, before they fell, were naked and unashamed, as we read in Genesis 3, 7. And then, interestingly enough, after the fall, they covered themselves with fig leaves because they felt shame. They couldn't even look up at God. First time in history that occurred. They felt shame and they covered themselves. And yet we would ask, if they fell by eating a food, apple, mango, banana, orange, why didn't they cover their mouth? And why didn't they cover their hand? As our little children do when they steal cookies from the cookie jar. Did you take the cookies? No. The point here is that they hid something that they misused. And they hid their sexual parts. The power of love is the most powerful force that we know in human civilization. And it is so easy to use love for lust, lusting or selfish purposes. In Job 31, 33, we read confirmation up to this point. I have concealed my transgressions like Adam by hiding my iniquity within my bosom. What Adam hid is what was used in an improper fashion. In other words, somehow the misuse of divine love was what caused the fall. Well then, let's examine the question further. If somehow evil love, impure love was the foundation of the fall, what sense do we make out of the book of John, chapter 8, 44th verse, in which our Lord tells us, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. How could it be so that our father is the devil? And then later we read in Romans 8, 23, we ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit grown inwardly as we await for adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies. Who needs adoption? Only children who have lost their parents. Adoption into a true lineage, engrafted into the tree of life. Because we have been born of a false lineage and we are truly dead trees. Later in the Ma book of Matthew 3 and 7 and Matthew 23, 33, John and Jesus respectively speak that we are a brood of vipers. The conclusion here is that we have been born as children of Satan, not the children of God. Well, then let's draw this whole picture into a nutshell. What caused the fall? We read in the scripture that the serpent tempted the woman to eat the fruit. Eating the fruit was a symbol of an act of love. A tree bears fruit, and in the fruit is the seed, and the seed is the foundation for future generations. When humankind have love, they pass the seed, and the seed becomes the basis of a new child. To eat the fruit was to consume something so precious related to the tree of knowledge of good and evil that it was so precious that God warned them, don't touch it. Don't touch it. The angel seduced the woman to eat the fruit. This meant that the angel had an act of love. He seduced and pulled her love to him. And they entered a relationship of sexual love. And then, having experienced that relationship, Eve turned to her husband-to-be, and they joined together in love, not under the umbrella of God's blessing, but separate from God's blessing. Fornication, therefore, 
was the act committed in original sin. It was not eating of food. It was the act of fornication. Now, you might ask, how in the world can that be so? But let's think. In all major religions, and certainly in the Judeo-Christian tradition, adultery is seen as either the most grievous or a grievous, most, a most grievous sin. The Israelites practiced the rite of circumcision, cutting the male foreskin, which symbolized in the age of atonement an act of reparation for that which was improperly used. And we also find that if a woman was found in the act of adultery, she should be stoned immediately. Even in recent years in the Middle East, that's true. No matter how advanced our technology and our scientific awareness is today, there is no power save the power of God that can turn people away from the use of love for selfish and wicked purposes. Impure love is truly the bedrock of fallen society. It is because Satan has controlled the emotions of human beings throughout history because Satan stands in the position of the father of the human race. The conclusion again, we did not fall by eating a physical food, but by misusing the most precious blessing that God gave us. That would have achieved the purpose of creation. Well, let's now examine the second major theme in this pre presentation. What were the motives and what was the process of the fall? Admittedly, it's a provocative thought that an angel seduce a woman and a woman seduce the man. The motive of the fall, of course, involves the character of angels. Now, I don't know if you've seen angels recently. They're not so easy to see. But of course, we've got to remember that our spiritual perception is more or less dull as a result of sin. Spiritual perception, much like antenna that have become corroded and not able to receive radio signals. Consequently, there are many people in our congregations, not to mention the fact that people who are not even saved or even religious at all, who are not sure whether life after death occurs I'm not sure whether God exists, not sure whether we even have a mind. There is an entire civilization in one part of the world that preaches that the world is nothing but matter. Our spiritual awareness is quite dull. We examine the question of angels in unification principles. Why did God create angels? We read in Hebrews 1.14 that they were created as servants to help with the creation and the administration of the world. And yet God created man in a position to dominate the angels as we read in 1 Corinthians 6.3. Do you not know that you are to judge the angels? As a result of the fall, we fell below the creation in value. So we commonly think of angels as very high spiritual beings. The key point here is that the fall occurred in the involvement of an angel with a woman. How? We're going to talk here about what is called in unificationism the spiritual fall and the physical fall. The spiritual fall occurred as the serpent tempted the woman to eat the fruit. What this meant was that Lucifer, as we read in Isaiah 14, 12, the day star, Lucifer seduced Eve. How could it have happened? Originally, God created the angelic world before humankind, and we have to uh, understand that Lucifer as an archangel, Lucifer as an archangel, would have been the central figure for the angelic world. Much like in the human world, Abraham was the central figure for the Israelites, and God passed his blessing to the Israelites through Abraham. Lucifer witnessed the birth of Adam and Eve. He saw the creation of God's children. We could imagine that he assisted in that creation. And as he saw God's children come alive, he had to witness the fact that God loved his son and his daughter more 
than he had loved any entity in his created universe. Lucifer then had to observe how God loved his children, and he naturally felt attracted to a greater degree of love. We can never forget that selfishness is always around when we sin. The essence of evil, the basis of evil, the opposite of God's nature is selfishness. Lucifer, therefore, felt the desire for more love, the desire for greater love. He was attracted to God's children. Eve reflected pure beauty from God's love. As they related and corresponded and developed a relationship, eventually emotions began to flow. Lucifer's desire for greater love was stimulated, and Eve's latent desire for the fulfillment of love was, was pricked. And as a result, eventually they drew closer together. Lucifer could see that Adam was meant to be the spouse of Eve. And we could perhaps imagine then that Lucifer's jealousy emerged. He wanted more love. He wanted to be fulfilled in love. And eventually, the relationship was consummated as they went farther and farther away from the commandment. Finally, the spiritual fall occurred. And on the basis of the spiritual fall, the elements of fear and guilt entered the heart of Eve. And therefore, she had the pangs of conscience. She wanted to come back to God. And how did she do that? But she turned towards Adam. And that's how the physical fall happened. She turned towards Adam knowing that Adam was to be her husband. And yet now she's motivated out of an evil desire, a selfish desire. And gradually, Adam was not able to maintain his proper position, holding on to the commandment, and he fell. The two of them had a premature relationship that was centered not on the desire and the motive of God, but on the desire of evil. The ideal family, therefore, was prevented by Satan. Instead of expressing God's heart as a husband and wife, it was Satan who became the foundation of human family. And also, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was Eve, had she obeyed the commandment, would have produced fruits of goodness, children of goodness. But because it moved in a direction opposite to God's will, it created fruits of evil. The tree of the knowledge of good or evil, that is who Eve represented. According to the principles of creation, God is to accomplish his purpose of creation through love. Love is the essence of life. True love is the most valuable aspect of the universe. True love always benefits everything, everyone, every being. False love is robbery. True love is life-giving. The strongest force in the universe is that love. And God, who is formless, he has no body. That's why he created mankind. He has true love as the strongest force, and God's ideal would be fashioned and fulfilled when his love would be embodied in a true husband and wife. We can even say that Heavenly Father wanted to see the marriage of Adam and Eve, having perfected themselves individually. And not only the marriage, but he wanted to partake in that act of love. And the miracle of life would, be, would have been born, not simply in a biological fashion, but God's love would be implanted in the heart of a child, and children would be born sinless. This is the reason why God has given love as the most powerful force. Well, now he knew that his son and daughter were immature. And so in the period of their growth, they had to follow the commandment in order to keep them on track. A very good example is that of a train moving on a track. The train is moving towards its destination, which is likened to perfection. The track is the track of the principle. And as long as we stay on the principle, everything is fine. It's only when a force stronger than the principle moves us off. And what force is stronger than the principle but the force of love? 
Now, in particular, in their immature state, non-principled love has a greater power than the course of principle. And it's for this reason that in order to prevent the fall, in order to prevent the abuse of that pure love that would be eventually their destination, God gave the commandment in Genesis 2.17. Now we can understand that the commandment to eat the fruit was a warning to keep his children on track. He was basically saying to them, do not consummate the relationship as husband and wife until you have achieved perfection until you've achieved individual oneness with me. Had they obeyed the commandment, they would have been protected from the force of non-principled love, and they would have been able to overcome the unrighteous desire in Lucifer. You could think of the uh, period of time as that unrighteous, uh, the period of time of obeying the commandment would have been as long as it would have taken them to grow to perfection. Naturally, it should have occurred as they grew physically, to adulthood, they should also grow spiritually to perfection simply by obeying the Word of God. I'm sure you have had experiences in your life or in your congregation of how a parent will be so concerned when their sons and daughters go out on their first dates. Teenagers today are so free with love, and it's not good because God did not plan that love be abused he wanted love to be held sacred. The sacred palace of love would be the home because based on that would come a lineage of true children. That's why parents are concerned that when their daughter goes out on the first date, they come home intact and pure. It's very natural. And it's exactly the same desire that God had. Let's now turn to the important section of the results of the fall. The results. What happened as a result of the infraction of love that occurred in the garden? First of all, rather than becoming the individual embodiment of God's love, Adam and Eve became fathered by Satan, dominated in spirit, in heart, by evil love. Rather than horizontally expressing God's divine love as a couple, they consummated their love. They drew that relationship into oneness. They became one flesh. And instead of expressing divine love to one another, it became satanic. Children were therefore born with original sin. And as we have known in our life of faith, original sin is the deepest hook that the devil has in us. God wanted Adam to see in Eve's eyes a true daughter of heaven. And he wanted to see in she he wanted Eve to see in Adam's eyes a true son. He wanted them to be able to experience the divinity of their respective natures in one another, as though Adam and Eve would become the, the counterpart of each other. God's full nature would have been expressed ex uh, fully and, and holistically in such a family. Throughout history, Satan has dominated humankind through the fall and through sin. That's why we read in John 8, 44, that Satan is the god of this world, uh, that Satan is the, the father. We, are, we do the will of our fathers. And in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, that Satan is the god of this world. And John 12.31, that he's the ruler of the world. We read in Romans 8.19, the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. We can see that the entire history of humankind is a result of the fall. And Satan has been able to control us through temptation. Temptation occurs through our mind, through our body. Because of the foundation of evil activities on earth, when we enter the spiritual world, if we've lived an evil life on earth, we dwell in that hell in the spiritual world. We have literally created a hell upon the earth because of evil love. A word here about the question of good and evil. 
we realize that <clears throat> an action by itself is neither good nor evil unless it is used for the sake of fulfilling God's will or if it is used for the sake of fulfilling Satan's will. Then the action has value or the lack of value. In other words, sexuality by itself is a natural gift from God. And when we use our ability to have children <clears throat> for the sake of God's will, in line with God's purpose, it fulfills the kingdom of heaven on the earth. And when we allow ourselves to be dominated by selfishness, it is therefore on the road to evil. That's how as unificationism teaches the uh, absolute difference between good and evil can be seen. It certainly is not a relative thing that is left up for uh, modern-day philosophers to banter around. A word here about sin. Sin is any act or thought <clears throat> which violates heavenly law, creating the condition through which one forms a base with Satan. Original sin was the act of love uh, perpetrated in the garden under Satan's will that is the basis of human life. Original sin then gave birth to a whole civilization of evil. And throughout the history of mankind, that trunk of sin we call hereditary sin. The branches of collective sin form the common day, the current network or the current uh, structure or foundation of evil around us today. When we sin as a people, when the Christian faith uh, out of a sin of omission fails to accomplish God's will, that is known as a collective sin. And finally, the fruits of sin, uh, the leaves of sin, are the personal sins that we commit in our own life. And in order to get rid of all of it, we have to go down to the root. That's why we need salvation. That's why Jesus must come as the true Adam, the last Adam, in order to eradicate original sin. The fall gave birth to a human civilization that has been based upon a fallen nature rather than God's nature. Instead of inheriting the original nature of our Heavenly Father, we have inherited the nature of evil. The basis of that evil is of four parts, we might say. The first is that we have the tendency to not love the same way that God loves. We see that in Lucifer when he observed Adam and Eve and he saw them from a selfish standpoint. Isn't it so that so often in our life we do the same thing? We may look at our congregation or look at people in our congregation from a selfish standpoint. And rather than being able to forgive them and love them, we take their abuses personally and their criticism personally. We have to aim to see the way God sees things. That's why prayer and repentance is so important. Secondly, Lucifer left his proper position. He was supposed to remain as the servant of, his, of, of Adam and Eve, and he left that position and tried to dominate Adam and Eve. We do that all the time in our life as we seek to be in positions of higher value without being qualified. Thirdly, he, the, uh, Lucifer reversed the order of love, the order of proper dominion. He overcame Adam and dominated Adam when Adam was supposed to have guided and dominated him. Had Lucifer obeyed the commandment, had Adam obeyed the commandment, they would have, he would have felt perfect love through Adam and through Eve. And finally, the fourth major aspect of this nature is to multiply evil as we do all the time. Isn't it incredible the way someone does something improper, the first thing that they'll try to do is gather other people as accomplice, accomplices to the crime or share their guilt in a way that makes other people take on the guilt. This fallen nature, four parts, is something we can identify in our daily life. And once we begin to identify these elements of our nature, we can, on a daily basis, cleanse and repent these aspects final point of the fall of man. If God is almighty, why didn't he stop him? Why didn't God do something? Why didn't God intervene? There's re three reasons why this did not occur. Three reasons why God, even though he's almighty, did not step in and stop his children from violating 
his law of love. The first is because he wants to give inviolability and perfection to the word of God. God's word or God's principles are set down as absolute. God is perfect. His will is perfect. He gave Adam and Eve the, the guidance in the commandment in Genesis 2.17, and it was their responsibility to achieve the oneness with that commandment. God couldn't mess with their responsibility. Otherwise, he would have violated his own commandment. The second reason is because God alone is the creator. If God had give and take action with the characters in the fall of man, he would have sanctioned their existence under the umbrella of Satan's dominion. That means that God would have given credence. He would have given sanction to Satan's act of creativity. Because God alone is the creator of the universe, he could not have give and take with that phenomenon, so he has to stay out of it. The third reason why God could not intervene at the fall is because he wants us to be the Lord of all creation. In order to be the Lords of creation, we have to be qualified. To be qualified means we have to fulfill our responsibility. And to fulfill our responsibility means we have to obey the commandment. If we fail to obey the commandment, we violate our qualification as a Lord of a creation. If God intervenes and forces us on the way of righteousness, then we cannot stand as the subject of the universe, the Lords of creation, the stewards of God's uh, world. And therefore, in order to maintain perfection of the principle, God alone is creator, and to allow man to be the, uh, the son and daughter of Heavenly Father, as well as have dominion over the universe, he had to refrain from violating our portion of responsibility. The final issue, prayer. We've got to pray in this new age to know God's heart, not simply to know the word, not simply to know the law, but we're able to have an experience with God's heart in this age. If you really search in the unification principles, you'll find it. Obviously, regardless of what I say or what anyone tells you, unless you experience with God in your prayer, Unless Jesus confirms for you that this is true, it's not going to hold to be true. You don't know who I am, and I'm doing my best to simply explain it. But the main point is that if you really understand the heart of God, perhaps you'll experience the suffering that God felt, the in, in, inexpressible pain. He had so much hope, and yet he saw his children violate that hope. It's not that God is a God of wrath as much as God is a God of heart and a God of love. Therefore, the appropriate response to this question of the fall is a response of, of very deep and profound, thoughtful prayer. I encourage you to examine the, the text that is offered with these uh, lectures and to s examine the Holy Bible and ask God yourself, is it possible that God's ideal truly be that we achieve perfected families? And is it possible that the fall really happened because we violated the commandment of love? Is it possible that salvation in its fullest form will mean that we each can achieve oneness with God and the manifestation of that love on the earth in true families. In the following presentation, we're going to take a deeper look into the question of predestination. How could it be that a loving God would have planned to create a, a creature that would violate his own commandment? And what's the relationship between our sin, God's will, and our free will? Thank you very much for listening. The topic, predestination.
throughout the history of Christian experience, the question of predestination has confused many theologians and religious leaders. We've just finished examining the presentation on the fall of man. And we've got to ask ourselves the question in all honesty today, does God really plan for evil to occur? If we take the view of absolute predestination seriously, it really does mean that our Heavenly Father not only knows that all the evil that has occurred in history will occur, but it means that in some fashion he has to plan that that evil will happen. Unification principle examines the question of predestination based upon the purpose of God's creation of the universe. Traditionally, the passages in the Holy Bible that uh, describe predestination in an absolute way basically come from uh, the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 29 and 30, later on in the ninth chapter, verses 10 and 13. We have a view there that somehow God knows what will happen and predestines what will occur. And yet we find in the Holy Bible other passages that deal with predestination in a different way. Let's take, for example, the passage of God's commandment in Genesis 2.17. Our Heavenly Father gave us the commandment, do not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of it, you will surely die. Obviously, it was up to Adam and Eve, who had free will, to choose whether they would eat the fruit or not. We read in the book of John 3.16 that God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, should not perish but have eternal life. The emphasis here is on the word whoever. Anybody who accepts Jesus Christ as the Savior, as their Savior, will have the right to salvation. God does not already decide who is going to receive Jesus, but he leaves that up to us. As all of us know in our congregations, no matter how much you do to help people in your congregation through your prayer and your counseling, through giving sermons, isn't it interesting that it always depends upon that person's choice? We've got to choose Jesus. No one can make that decision for us. Read in the book of Matthew 7, verse 7. Jesus himself is speaking. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks will receive. And he who seeks will find. And he who knocks, for he who knocks it will be, be opened. The point here is that it is clearly up to us to choose God's way of life. God, in a way, is powerless to influence our lives. He has the grace to draw us to him. But you and I have to make that final choice. One of my favorite passages in the Holy Bible comes from the Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. In America today, God will be able to work if, as Christians, we repent and seek God's life in us. If we fail to do that, it will be future generations that will suffer even more than us. God is waiting for us to respond to him in this day like he was expecting and hoping for them to respond in the Garden of Eden. Well, let's take up the issue here of predestination. If we're, if we're truly uh, accept, if we accept unconditionally the traditional view of predestination, then we have to believe that God planned for the fall. He planned for sin throughout history. And the issue that unification principle approaches is that God definitely predestines his will. Now, God is absolutely good. And consequently, everything that God plans or decides would have to coincide with his inner nature. Nothing that Heavenly Father does is evil. God is absolutely good. He created the universe to fulfill his purpose of creation, which was to express 
his love, to express his heart, to establish the ideal of creation where his children would be living in sinless prosperity, sinless love, sinless joy. God is absolutely good. This means that God absolutely predestines only that which is good. He can't predestine something that contradicts his own inner nature. It was only because of the failure of humankind in the Garden of Eden that our Heavenly Father had to divert his original purpose to the purpose of the dispensation for salvation. The only reason that God needs to save us is because we fell into sin. Now, is the purpose of restoration or the purpose of salvation, could that be different than the purpose of creation? They both lead towards goodness. They both lead towards goodness. Consequently, God is absolutely good. His original purpose of creation is good. The purpose of restoration is good because what's the goal of restoration? What's the goal of salvation? It is nothing other than building that original kingdom upon the earth and in the spiritual world. We can see then that God predestines his will of goodness only in the direction of good. We read in 1 Samuel's 15.11 that God regretted the fact that he appointed Saul as king. How could he regret that he appointed Saul as king if he had predestined Saul to be the king? And later on, in a most fascinating and, and exciting aspect of the Old Testament for me is in the book of Ezekiel 33.11, when God is speaking to, the, to Jonah concerning the people of Nineveh. He says, Say to them as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Again, no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? God did not want to see the people sin. He wants to see us choose life, choose love, choose righteousness. And it is up to his children to do so. Later in the same passage, 33 and 14 of Ezekiel, Though I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, yet if he turns from his sins and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge and gives back what he has taken by robbery and walks in the statue of life, committing no iniquity, he shall surely live and he will not die. God is a being who predestines goodness, he predestines his purpose to be accomplished. So to what extent has he actually predestined his will? This brings us to the third and final aspect I wanted to share about briefly here. God is eternal, absolute, and unchanging. That means that God's purpose never, ever, ever changes. He predestined to accomplish his will of goodness, that is the kingdom of God upon the earth, and even though the original Adam and Eve, the original ancestors, failed to accomplish God's will, he doesn't divert his will. He doesn't change his will. He doesn't change his mind. Isaiah 46.11 tells us, I have spoken it, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it, and I will do it. Our God in heaven will not change his mind, even though we change. Now, what this means is that God predestines his will but he does not predestine the accomplishment of his will. The predestination of the accomplishment of the will depends upon humankind responding to the word of God. It is only when people seize God's words and fulfill them is God's will accomplished upon the earth. This is why in unification principle we teach that God's purpose like his nature, is eternal, unchanging, and absolute. And God's will is to fulfill the purpose of creation. When we lost the purpose of creation at the time of the fall, he changed his purpose to the purpose of restoration, 
but the goal is exactly the same. Consequently, God's will is absolute, eternal, and unchanging. Now, in unification principle, in the, in the principle of creation, we talked about human responsibility. Human responsibility is that area of responsibility, a portion of responsibility that God gives us to fulfill. God does almost everything, we could say figuratively, 95%. God accomplishes 95% of the whole. But he gives his son and daughter a little bit of responsibility, just a little bit, as though he were building a building and he put all the bricks in the building except for one final row of bricks. And he asks you and myself to put those final bricks in the building. Those final bricks are the human responsibility. Now, it may only be 5% of the total picture, but in relationship to God, he gives 100%, we have to give 100%. That's why whenever we examine our life of faith, whenever we really try to accomplish God's will, miracles can happen. When the pastor prepares his sermon, if he sincerely approaches that great and profound act of speaking the word of God, God is able to work through you. If you neglect the preparation, if you neglect the prayer, if you neglect the, the effort that it takes to be a religious leader, God is powerless. He can't work through us unless we make the foundation. It's a joint responsibility. We describe it as the accomplishment of God's will based upon God's responsibility being accomplished, which is always done, and man's responsibility be ac being accomplished, which has tragically rarely been accomplished. Rarely do we fulfill God's will. And that's the reason why throughout the course of history, history seems to repeat itself over and over again. When we choose to accomplish our responsibility, when we sacrifice ourselves in that direction, we then, in a way, liberate God. John 3.16 Whoever chooses his son will be saved. Whoever, whoever, anyone who chooses Jesus as Lord and Savior will find salvation. We read in the book of James 5.15 The prayer of faith will save a sick man. Mark 5.34 Your faith has made you well. Your faith is the area of work that you, your people, and all Christians have to accomplish. Your faith. Everyone who asks receives, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If we truly knock on the door of God's house, he will open it for us. If we do not perform the function of knocking, he cannot work. Clearly, God predestines his will to be accomplished, but he does not predestine the actual accomplishment because that depends upon his sons and daughters achieving their portion of responsibility. Let us conclude the question of predestination by thinking the scripture of God's words can lead us in many different directions. It is absolutely true but again, as we said in the very beginning of the series of presentations, we are living in a time when the seemingly contradictory statements in the Bible can be answered by a broader perspective of God's original purpose and human responsibility in line with that purpose. In the next presentation, we're going to examine the purpose of the coming of the Messiah and how we are to achieve God's will in relationship to the Messiah. Thank you very much.